Welcome back to Matan's podcast. This is your host, Dr. Yosefa Fogel Rubel, and this is a special episode featuring a conversation between Chaya Bina Katz, Rabbanit Osher Korin, and moderated by Devorah Katz, a valued member of the Matan team. Hi, everybody. My name is Devorah Levine Katz, and I am privileged, really privileged, to be sitting today talking to Chaya Bina Katz and Osher Korin, both of Matan fame. And today, I think I reached out because I really wanted to hear a little bit more about what Matan is doing. I think for the past 36 years, Matan has really been foundational in creating an environment for women's Torah learning. But specifically in the past two months, since October 7th, the activities that Matana has is doing and have inspired people to do really transcends not only the Beit Midrash, and we'll talk about the Beit Midrash a bit also, but beyond that, reaching out to the communities that both of you live in and beyond. So that's my motivation here. And I've been really, I think, anxious to have this conversation because I think that both of you have a tremendous amount to share. So Chaya, I'm actually going to start with you and maybe even before we talk about the past two months, which it literally is past two months, it's December 7th as we're recording. Um, before the past two months, talk a little bit about your relationship with Matan, which sounds a ridiculous question to be asking you, but you know, let's let's even start from there. Well, actually, Osher was the first, Rabbanit Osher Koren was the first student at Matan. Uh, so I feel like, you know, Katonti to start, uh, maybe, you know, to begin, but thank you. Um, I think that, you know, Matan was something, uh, it's a reality that what I was born into, you know, it's something that my mother started 36 years ago here in Yerushalayim. Then, uh, you know, Rabbi Koren was our first, you know, a woman leader to spread out of Yerushalayim, to spread that dream that, you know, my mother had and continue it onwards. And um, back to your question, what is Matan to me? I think yeah. it, what is it? It, it, it's a continuation of a dream that every day uh, we try to improve, we try to make it better, we try to see how this dream can continue to our daughters, granddaughters, and of course I don't think it's just for women anymore. Uh, many times uh, you, you, many times we, at, we are asked the question, can men join? Uh, where is it at? You know, so I think certain programs uh, are, are targeted for different audiences. And uh, I'm proud to continue the dream and to be living in a dream every day. You did great. That's a great answer. And the truth is, Rabbanit Oshra, I don't think that I realized that you were among the first women in the program, because I feel like I've stepped on board and have watched things develop in the past number of years. And I think, hi, when you talk now about, oh, men can join, and I also think there's a tremendous amount of flexibility within the program itself. It's no longer you must come to a Beit Midrash and sit in this Beit Midrash and learn, but maybe that's a byproduct of COVID, but there's hybrid and there's Zoom there's and there are 11 branches. But Osher, I would love to hear what it was like at the start, what your relationship was then and how it's grown since. So the truth is, it's hard for me to say how many years ago, but it is um, when I finished Shavuot Lumi, when I was 20 years old, I was looking for a place to learn Torah. I grew up in a home with five older brothers, and I remember some of them coming back with their experience about learning in yeshiva, and I was jealous. And then when I finished, when I finished with Lumi, I was looking for yeshiva, but can you believe it? It, do, it didn't exist. And so I went to study in Hebrew U. And then I got married. One Tokhkide when I got married. I heard from one of the Rabbaniot, uh, Rabbanita, uh, what was her name, Hani, I forgot her name right now. And she said to me, Malki Bina is opening a Beit Midrash for women. And I thought that it would be perfect for you. She's looking for young women that are passionate about learning Torah, that have a background. And um, that's, and, and then I, I, you know, I was so excited. So I was with the first cohort of what was called the Matmidot program, which was like a kolel program four women, and we studied Tanakh and Talmud and Midrash, and that's how it all began. 36 years ago when Rabbanit Malka Bina opened, I was in the first Matmidot program. I was there for four years, and then my dream was, to, I knew I would leave Yerushalayim. My husband and I said we have to be meaningful elsewhere, and we um, we moved to Ranana, and I said to Rabbanit Malka, I said to Malki, 
I want to open, my dream is to open a matan in Ranana. And Malka and I went to meet uh, with Debbie Tenenbaum, with the Tenenbaum family. She brought about 40 women to her living room. And I said, I'm moving to Ranana in August. And they said, okay, go for it. And uh, that's it. 30, what was it? About 31 years ago, I started Matan in Ranana with the full support of Rabbanit Malki, who always supported me and always believed, believed in me. And um, that, that, that was my dream. It's a dream uh, come true, that there will be a place of learning for women, Torah Lishma. Um, I can go on and on. So just tell me where you want. Well, I think that that infrastructure that was created is fantastic. And it only grew from there. But one of the points that I wanted to make that I've always so impressed by is that women that have been involved in Matan, and I see it in Matan Yerushalayim a lot. I'm not sure. Tell me if it's the same in Onana, but it's women who have been coming to Matan for 20 or 30 years. Like that commitment continued on. So, hi, I wonder if you can speak to that a little bit about really generationally women that have been coming to Matan? I think the nicest thing we see is when you see a mother-daughter coming in for like a fun day. And now now in the war, actually, we have um, one, of our, one of our, you know, I think it's a, it's a, Roz Berlin has been taking classes here for maybe 25 years. And now in the war, she has a daughter who has five, five sons. And her husband is also a, been drafted. So, so there it's, she doesn't live in Yerushalayim, but I guess she's spending more time in Yerushalayim, Rachel. Uh, sorry, I don't know her last name. And it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing to see how I think, you know, I don't know who's helping who more, you know, the mother or the daughter here at the, in this situation, but that the Torah brings them together, brings them to Yerushalayim, brings them, uh, you know, to spend the morning together learning. Then I guess I hope they go out for coffee, discuss what they're learning. But, um, and, you know, and, and the nice, and, and, you know, they each, each of them takes out a, a piece of paper with like the soldiers they're praying for, the people they're caring for. And that's just like a little, you know, someone we've known for so many years. We actually uh, take a weekly picture together. I feel like I need to give her an album of like all those pictures we mm-hmm. take together. We send her to her granddaughter. It's, that's like that. And, th- and then seeing, you know, how they, they come with their daughters and they come with their granddaughters and, and continue on for many, many, many generations of, of this family Torah learning. I agree. I think that there's something that is so remarkably powerful about this idea that there's a Beit Midrash that is rooted so deeply in family's DNA that it continues on generationally. And I think a great example of that would be the Bat Mitzvah program that's been going on for so many years. Um, Osher, do you want to talk a little bit about that program? Yeah, of course. So what I wanted to say is, um, continuing what Chaya was saying, is that, as you said, it's not only a mother and daughter coming, it's it's a grandmother coming with her granddaughter, and I even had a great-grandmother, um, Elaine Aber, coming with her granddaughter, and even her grandson was in Matan this week. It was unbelievable. And with the Bat Mitzvah program, talking about the generation, I have I started the Bat Mitzvah program when I was pregnant with my youngest daughter, so that means she's 28, so it's about 29 years ago. And um, I have now mother, mothers in the program, the Bat Mitzvah program, that were girls. They were 12-year-olds in my program. And can you believe it? I'm still teaching the program. I'm still with the 12-year-olds. But um, so it's unbelievable. And what the Bat Mitzvah program does is really connect the girls to the chain of Jewish women and coming with their mothers. And then at the party, I invite the grandmothers to come and some even come with their great-grandmothers. And for them to connect to that chain and to the values that are important for their mothers. It's really, it's, it's beautiful, really beautiful. Now, the Bat Mitzvah program is all about um, providing the girls with um, positive female role models that are there in our tradition and putting the limelight on them, putting them on center stage and say, here, look how many heroines we have in our, in our heritage. Now, now with the war, we're rethinking now how we can incorporate the new heroines that we have and how we can connect them. I'll give you an example. I just taught a shir about Dvora and Yael and to the bat mitzvah girls and their mothers. And then I said to them, I started saying how Yael lures in Sisra to come into her tent. And she says to him, Sura, Sura Adoni. And then I said, you know, I was going back and forth through Rachel from Ofakim and Yael, showing them how 
It's all connected. It's all, as you were saying, it's all in our DNA. These role models live inside of us. We have a Miriam who has vision. We have a Devorah who's a leader. We have Chana who prays. We have Esther who stands up for her nation. And I can go on and on. And Dona Grazia who also sacrifices her place for the women. Until we get to the modern day women and the women who built and continue to build the state of Israel. That is what the Bat Mitzvah program is all about. And connecting them to their mother through learning, through positive Jewish um, 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 activities and positive Judaism. That's what we want to give them. And this Bat Mitzvah program is in Israel. It's all over the country and all over the world. It even reached Australia, Hong Kong, all over the world. This is this is what it is, connecting them to the Jewish identity. The Bat Mitzvah program is also for Chiloniot, not just for Datiot. Really, it's it's Hatamanashit, female empowerment. That's what we provide, connecting them to that. I love the idea of finding relevance in old texts and in this day. When you talk about bringing in Rachel from Ofakim, when you talk about role models that we're seeing in this day and age, there's something that's so powerful about allowing that connection to really be seen and crystallized for the younger generation, certainly, but also for for us. Um, so at this point, we've discussed and we've hit on a little bit of the history of Matan. We've talked about the Beit Midrash, the Mat Midot program, the um, the Bat Mitzvah program. But Chaya, I wonder if you could talk about the differentiation, the, all the sorts of different types of programs and who you were finding and how you were bringing them in. Because I think one of the remarkable things is, ah, there's uh, somebody that wants to sit in a Beit Midrash and learn Torah, and that's one person. But I think that there are so many other people that you could be reaching. And I think one of the beautiful parts of Matan is that L'Chatrila, they want everybody to find their space there. Right. Well, I think uh, we call maybe uh, the heart of Matan is our Beit Midrash programs. And in, in the Beit Midrash programs, we have our, the, the we have two new additions, one in Ranana, which is at Galia, which is an interdisciplinary Tanakh program that started this past year. And in Yerushalayim, two years ago, we began the Kitmuni program, which is a writing program. We, we now have 11 women that are working on putting out their books, putting out, you know, what we're doing. You know, if, we, if it started by women learning, now we want to continue and go, when we go to the bookshelf, see the women writing, see, you know, give give the women what we call the shelf esteem, that they could continue with that with that book and take, you know, a, be stronger, be better leaders, a, get more, you know, get more in, known, especially if, especially if they're not doctorates, you know, don't have a, do, uh, you know, an academic degree, this, and they have a, a rabbinic degree, but this, a book gives you another, you know, another thing sure. to, to hang and to be proud of. And we're proud of these women. And we, and now after 36 years of this big Midrash style and a being of learning, we think that this, it's the right time to have them a uh, write and then, uh, and sponsor their writing and writing a uh, writing ship scholarship and then we have um, the Hilchata program also that's on its um, second um, cohort of women becoming basically rabbis, but we're Orthodox, so we're not calling them rabbis. I would call them rabbis, but um, that that's me. But I think these women are just, they don't necessarily need a title. I think that's the difference between the, the Torah that we learn here at Matan. That yes, maybe you need a title, but here these women are, don't really, they're, they're so knowledgeable and have so many years of learning and natural leadership that they don't necessarily need the title. They do exams, written, oral exams. They practice, they answer questions. I mean, we could sit here, Osho and I, and Rabbi Nikor and I all day long and talk about the different programs, you know, eh, the WhatsApp groups and uh, other things that Osho will tell you a little more on. Um, and I and I think, and then, and then you have, you know, then before that we had Gemara programs and things changes, that turned into the Halakha program. Hilchata, we call it in Yerushalayim. There's halacha programs in Ranana also, and um, there's you know if you if you're in the beginning of your learning, you could do two three days and take different classes into interdisciplinary. Take uh, Tanakh, take Talmud, and um, make your own schedule, but have still have like a Beit Midrash style class and anchor. That's, you know, that's off the top of my head. Then, you, of course, you could always drop into a class, do a tour, you know, um, 
Tanakh tours around Yerushalayim and other places, depending on weather um, and uh, and our wars and and COVID before this. Um, we and um, I think that you know, how do we get to the women? Many times they get to us. You know, we, it's word of mouth. Also, it's it's a certain it's a certain type that is interested, and they get to us through many times through their friends or you know advertisement and. Uh, all the Batani Drash still need to work hard in finding students. I think it's not a natural place for all women to come to or make a career of. And that will, that's definitely, you know, on our, our on our agenda to make it more of a career for them. And that's why we start different other programs like the Hilchata that then gives is easier for them to have jobs like Kitvuni if you're writing and that's a field that you want to go into more and other programs. Well, the truth is that it's the three of us are sitting here talking, but the reality is that we could have, I don't know, seven, eight, nine more women on this podcast who are running branches of Matan around the country. It's not that there's in Yerushalayim and Ranana and that's it. The reality is that you're up and down the map of Israel. I'm going to leave them out. I'm going to forget some. So you could just help me out here. I think that there's in Netanya, there's in Zichron Yaakov, Hashmonaim, Beit Shemesh, Modi'in. What else Rechobot. am I missing? Rehovot. I think that's meaning that's it, it, be, it became something where people felt very, very confident in women's learning to say, oh, let's set up a branch here. And I think it's a testimony to both of you that it's not like, oh, this is where our Beit Midrash is, but really where people want to learn Torah, we will set up a Te Midrash. And I think that that's something that's really so admirable. Um, I think we've hit, in my mind, um, this idea of who we were. And I, I want to talk about October 7th and this idea of what changed in the concept of what what our values were in Matan. Have they shifted? How have we seen that shift? I'm going to toss out two ideas and then I hope you take them and run with them. Um, Rabbanit Oshra, I would talk about the program that you were running for women whose husbands were in Milu'im um, in Ranana, because the reality is that's not a Beit Midrash. It's with children. It's with single moms who probably do not have the luxury of sitting right now for a shiur. But it wasn't that you said, okay, you know what, we'll wait when you're ready, or we'll put some things on Zoom or on YouTube. But there was very, very active response. So maybe you could talk a bit to that. So what happened was at the beginning of the war, Remember, there was no school, no activities, no more, nothing. The mothers were beside themselves, tearing their hairs out. And then we decided, okay, let's, you know, let's do something in Matan to help them. Because, you know, we feel as we've been saying, Torah is beyond just the Beit Midrash. It's Torah of Chaim. You want to reach the people. First of all, it's Torah of Chesed. It's not just Torah, you know, in the books. You want, you want the Torah to be, to give. That's what Torah is all about. And also, I'll tell you the truth, what happened also, a lot of young moms, it's an opportunity. As Chaya says, we want to bring people, we want to, them to acknowledge that a Beit Midrash exists. I mean, they're so busy. So by bringing these young moms, we're exposing them to Matan. And I said, okay, we have to help them out. So we started, to, and it grew and grew and grew like a ketana for the mothers and, and the children, you know, the husbands are in Milu'im, there's nothing going on. So I decided, at the beginning I did a few times a week, then I said, you know what, I'll do Kabbalah Shabbat every Thursday afternoon. So in that way, I wanted to not just be a ketana, but I wanted it to have some kind of erech musaf, extra value that Matan as a Torah place can provide. So, what we did is, of course, we had all the fun things with different um, stands. With we had cookie um, decorating. So now, before Hanukkah, I had this young young woman who in high school. Her mother is in our halacha program, and I asked the young girl, the teenager, she loves baking, so she made Hanukkah shaped cookies, and the kids or cupcakes, and the kids loved decorating them. And the mother thanked me because she said that's a way her daughter is not necessarily into the learning, but that's the way to connect her to the Beit Midrash and connect her to doing and to Astia and feeling, you no, know, she has significance. And then the girls love the little girls. I'm embarrassed to say in Matan, but not really embarrassed, but the nail polish and the makeup, 
the little girls liked it, you know, loved it. And then Kadu Regel and having art. And we did also Krav Maga. I, I, I brought someone to do self, you know, self-defense. Or as you say, also in English, it's called Krav Maga, right? It's and um, they call it Krav Maga. And we had, and then each time I brought a musician to do something. And then we had, each week I would bring a DJ. And we put up the music and with the screen and dancing together with them. So I said to myself at the beginning of the war especially, how can I justify dancing? So what I said to the kids is, I said, we are dancing for Abba because we know if we're happy and Ima's happy, Abba's happy. We're giving him strength. And, and I was also mocked some of the mothers are in Milo. So I said, we're giving Abba and Ima because sometimes the grandparents came with the kids because Abba and Ima are both in the And then every time I would get down on the floor and do with them, Am Yisrael Chai, you know, and O Davinu Chai. To connect them. And then a little Dvar Torah for Parshat Shavua we would do. And one week I did a challah bake. I got six women or seven women to prepare batsek. And I had 100 kids, 200 kids preparing challah. Doing, and we did a big hafrashat challah. And I did that online. I did it international with women for, from all over the world. Together with the kids in the Beit Midrash. Doing this challah bake for Am Yisrael. So I looked for ways to connect it with content. But the truth is just Torah of Chesed. I brought, I brought, um, I don't know how you say in English. Oh, bouncy you, houses. Bouncy houses. Each time something else to really connect them. This past a week, we did a Hanukkah, pre Hanukkah party. And I said, you know what? Instead of just giving prizes to the kids, I want to do a raffle for the moms. And I was able to get from different people in Ranano give services to do nails and do massages or restaurants, different things to give a shovar, to give a slip for the mothers so they will get a prize. And I'm big on every number wins. And I had the kids mm -hmm. come up and pick the prize for the mom, pick the envelopes for their mom. And we wrote a little note and we said, sister, we're here for you. We know you're having a hard time. We, we, we think you're the heroines, you're the Maccabiot of our generation. And the mothers really felt good. So that is one of the things we're doing, we've been doing. And um, we really feel it expands, expands the Beit Midrash, you know, beyond, beyond just the books. So that's it definitely does expand the Beit Midrash. And it definitely puts Matan as really a central part of Ranana, as really, you know, stepping into the community and stepping up. I actually want to just for a side note for a minute, the three of us all have family members serving in the army. So when you talk about what you're doing for the mother is like, will, will you share for a minute who in your family is serving right now? Right. So I have two sons um, are who are Hayalim, they're Lohamim, they're, you know, um, how do you say they're combat, combat, fighters. combat soldiers. One of them from uh, from Simchat Torah was serving in the South, and um, my other, my oldest son, Roy, who today it's his birthday. He's thirty birthday. six years old, and he is up. He's not here for his birthday. He is um, up on the Syrian border serving. He's a Golani, and he known as Kfir, my younger son, and um, yeah. So they're there, you know. So we're talking. We're talking here about the wives of, but we are the mothers of, and I know Absolutely. Deborah, you as well. And yeah. so what keeps us sane and what keeps us going, I remember at the beginning of the war, at the beginning, when it all happened, for a second, I felt like I couldn't breathe. You, know, you can't breathe. You said, what am I doing? And then the only thing I feel like helps us to breathe is being significant, is adding light. As the Baal Shem Tov would say, you know, how do you, dis how do you get rid of, the choshech, the darkness, by adding light. And he said, Me'at mina ol docher be mina choshech. A little bit of the light, you know, can get rid of the darkness. And everything that we do, every chesed that we do, every act of kindness, it helps the world and it helps us. And it helps... I think you know, that there's something that's that's remarkably true about all of us. Chaya, you also have somebody in... Do you want to share that for a second? My daughter's in, she's in her regular service and she's at, she's becoming an officer in the army. She's in the middle of officer training. I think the war caught us all like, you know, she's in, she's in the middle of officer training. Her. 
Kaya, you're going to have to. First, I'm, I salute her. She walks in the house. Oh, and right. She <laughs> called me last night. She's like, we're making a Hanukkah party tonight. I said, sure. Hanukkah party tonight <laughs> at the house. Um, went out to get all the stuff she wanted for the sushi. Um, and then, but I think that it's it's the, I think, Osha, you probably, you see it in your children and Thor, you see it in your son, that they, it's like these, they just become natural leaders in this situation. And they they take charge of wherever they are in, in their sweet way, their innocent way, because I mean, your, your children are older, Osha. Um, but it's, it's that they, they really, they, they feel like, you know, this is Yom Kudai, Yom, you know, and, and they're there. When she left that Saturday night after Simchat Torah on October 7th, back, she was home for Chag. I said to Yaakov, my husband, I said, Yaakov, does she have to go? Can't she just stay home? <laughs> and, you know, and Yaakov was like, Hi, she's in the army. She can't not go. But it was, you know, a, I don't know if, I, I mean, I know I probably would have done. But it was, she didn't have a second thought if to go or not to go. And they, they were scary moments there. You know, they, they took them to Fakim in the first week. Because if you're, you know, you're in the middle of a course that the army can do whatever they want with you, always. And, uh, you know, then they, then the second week they took them to do different things in the bases down south to clean different things. It's just, I think it's unbelievable what we see in these 18 to 45, some 60 even year olds that are doing Miluim is their, just, you know, their, their power, their strength, their emunah, bitachon, everything that you read about that you think is in the Tanakh, we're seeing it in front of our eyes, the way these I don't want to call them children. They're not children, but they are our children. So I guess they're children. They're children, but they'll never be. But you know what? When I look at, because I do have three nephews that are are in and out of Gaza. When I look at their pictures before and after Gaza, it's not the same. They're not. They're not twenty years old anymore. And that's and that's when it hits you. Like they're not. They're still our children, but they've seen and and gone through such experiences that I mean, we're never. None of us are going to be the same. But I think this is. It's a new reality for all of us, and even more so for our soldiers. Or do you what's want to impressive to me is um, what's impressive to me is that at a time where I think that if we were compassionate with ourselves, maybe we'd be in sweatpants watching Netflix, and instead we've sort of found ways to really, like Rabbanit Oshra is saying, is to add light into darkness. And um, part of that discussion, I think, surrounds the Eshkolot program, which we didn't even mention as one of the programs that Matan does. Mm -hmm. But the Eshkolot program for me was this unbelievable example of saying, what is it that we can do, not only for Am Yisrael that is here in Israel, but rather, how are we uh, a light unto people who aren't here. Um, and so to me, that was something that was so meaningful. Chaya, maybe talk a little bit about even how the idea of this Eshkolot mission happened. Well, I want to go back for a second to October 15th when our classes started. Okay, so universities didn't start that. You know, they we we usually start the same day the universities start and universities and different uh, colleges didn't start in Israel. Most universities have not began, you know, their first semester this year. And I felt like we're not a university. We're a learning program, you know, for different, for many, many ages. And part of, part of uh, trying to create some stability is to, to continue with what we do every year. And we, we found it important. Yes, it was hard. You know, we contacted all the teachers, see what they could do. The first week or two were on Zoom. We stayed on Zoom. You know, people felt safer being closer to their home. And I think that's what gave us like a Yes, it was a shaky start. It's still a shaky start because we don't have the same numbers. And I think we're not getting to the same reach of students that could commit to full year programs or full length classes. It's harder. We're, it's harder for every, for everyone. But I, but, but, and another one of these programs that began that week is our educators professional development, professional development Eshkolot program, which is a program a run by Rabbi Tarragon and Dr. Ariel Agustin. And they, um, Together, we, you know, we were thinking, yes, we started the program and we said, okay, but, you know, these, how do you, what's, you know, if this is an educational professional development program and these are Zionist professional, you know, and t educators, we want, you know, as I say, if you're a Zionist and you haven't been to Israel till now, then I don't know, you, I question your Zionism. It's okay if this goes on, uh, on the film, I think it's being a Zionist, <laughs> yes. putting it you know, out there. unless you can't travel, I don't know, but it just come to come give us a hug and go back home. I mean, you don't have to do a mission necessarily, but I we felt like 
these women, some of them are teachers, wouldn't be able to afford necessarily or to put together a whole mission. We did like a three day wham, a mission, you know, agriculture, of course, because that's what you know, we, we have to help the farming um, situation. And then we we took them, you know, the Rabbanut to hear the uh, woman, uh, Noah, Noah Lewis from the Rabbanut spoke about her Hebrew Kaddisha work that she's been doing. I mean, we of course started at the Koto. We met with Anil Shapila's father, Moshe Shapila, who told us about his son's heroic act on the day of the seventh. Um, and it just continued, it continued on to, you know, what could, and, and, and most important is we wanted these, these women, these teachers to take the stories back home because it can't, I mean, you see it on TV. Yes, there was a rally a few weeks ago, but it, you don't feel it till I think till you, I guess, a experience a siren maybe, or go to a Shiva home or feel, go to a funeral and, even more so, just walk into one of these hotels that we have all over Yerushalayim and other cities, and you're like, and in the middle of a hotel is like a, uh, you know, a basket of laundry, because people are coming and collecting their laundry. I mean, just these crazy things that we, you know, people are, are, are doing, hearing, and and living through are is a, is something we want these these edu- uh, educators to take back home with them. What I loved about um, watching their experience a little bit from a distance and a little bit, um, I was privileged to meet with them a bit as well. Um, I loved the commitment to um, paying attention to all the details. I think sometimes, especially during war, something that we would not have known to discuss maybe a month or two ago, but there are these large, huge things that are happening and we're following on the news and it's so, and it's so big. And all of a sudden you can sort of bring it down to really high, what you said, like a basket of laundry sitting in a hotel that somebody is coming to do for somebody else. Like there are these small moments that don't translate into world media. And so the commitment of the women that came on the program, first of all, to come during war and they're leaving their their jobs for four or five days. And I felt that it was, um, if I, if I would make the t-shirt, the official t-shirt, um, it would just be the tour of like Smarmorid of goosebumps, like every experience that they had to me, like it was so overwhelming and so beautiful. I mean, they're, they're going into hotels and they're going down to farm and they're taking pictures and they're donating things to soldiers. It felt that it was such an impactful trip not only for them, but for the people who organized the trip to really see the level of dedication that came with them while they were here. And since they've gone back, there have been articles written, YouTube videos, Instagram, like they are truly telling that story. So for me to think that 36 years ago, um, Rabbanit Malki Bina, your mom, starts this program for women's Beit Midrash, and from it has come this moment, which has been this journey of 11 different branches of Matan and different ways to access Matan. First of all, men and women being welcome through Zoom, through hybrid, on YouTube, on Facebook, on Instagram. There are so many different ways to access the podcast and the podcast. No, I mean, multiple, meaning at any point in time, you can, you can find the Torah of Matan somewhere, which is, which is just meaning breathtaking, really just breathtaking. Um, and I wonder, Maha, what's next? I'm not putting you on the spot, but guys, I'm putting you on the spot. When we're sitting in this moment, uh, two months into a war, what is, what is next? What's the, what's the vision or what's the dream? For the war or the dream for Matan? Um, I think we probably all have the same dream for the war. Um, <laughs> but let's... <laughs> Uh, for Matan, Matan has managed to stay relevant and current for for thirty six years. What's the next? What's the next dream? That what's the next platform? First of all, I feel like I always feel like when people say, "Wow, so many women are coming to Matan," and I think Shachai and I share the same thing is to every woman, and we can say also man, but every woman comes to Matan, we cannot rest. You know, we want every, I mean, it's never enough. And there are new generations all the time. So it's, I don't want to say more of the same, but I say every generation, there's a challenge of making it relevant. It's Torah Chaim. We can't speak, and we all know, even now. First of all, we can't speak the same language from before Corona and after Corona. People have different kinds of ways of listening and patience. 
now with the war, I mean, with, with what happened, we were trying to be relevant all the time. So we have new challenges of keeping, you know, the Torah relevant, it being Torah Chaim, and having more and more, exposing more and more women coming to Matan. And so that's for the general public. So we started a new program in Matan called Soulful Sunday. It's a program that um, that Tammy Levy, um, who works in Matan, comes from South Africa. And I'm saying it because because I think it brings a new kind of Torah also. Not every woman wants to sit and take you know a very textual course um, for the whole year, but are looking for something to touch them, something that's coming more from the world of, um, how would you say, imun? Do you know what I mean? Like that, that's what Soulful Sunday is. Life, life, how do you say life, um, life training courses and connecting it to Torah. So that's what Soulful Sunday is. We connect it together. We have, we have in Matan, we have a studio of dance and yoga. We have a studio that mostly our classes are for young girls and teenagers, enabling every girl to um, continue to dance in uh, not only at Sanua, but also connecting to, to, to Torah and to Judaism kind of dance through the music and through the values, finding, connecting to Guf and Nefesh, connecting to body and soul. That's what we do in the Chodrach in the studio. But on Soulful Sunday, we have, you know, one of these soulful classes and Pilates. So a woman can come for both. And that, what, what we're doing through that is we're connecting women who normally don't find themselves in Matan and here we're connecting them to Matan in a different way. It's maybe a new more a new age style that we're we're trying in Matan. And now I want to go over to the Halak programs. We are trying to um is because I'm thinking of the last one of the questions that I know you were going to ask us or maybe still will ask us what happened in the last 10 years. So I can go back to the last 30 years or the last 40 years, but let's go to the last 10 years. And I'm thinking what happened in the last 10 years? I think, Chaya, what happened in the last 10 years is the Halacha program. Is what we're trying to um, create Halachic, female Halachic leaders and um, put women, women hear the voice of women in Halacha and train women to be Meshivot Halacha, to be Poskot. Now, um, it, and, and in order for women, for there to have a wave of women, of, of being Pusco, we have to have more and more women, starting from a younger age, um, putting the time for learning Torah in depth, but having more and more women, learned women, being halachic women. So it's never enough. We have to continue. We have to open cohort after cohort to create um, to, to brand it. So in Yerushalayim, it's the Hilchata program. In Ranana, it's the Murot, the Halacha program, which was actually Chaya's idea that we started also in Ranana, in the center of Israel, have these Halachic women, not only in Yerushalayim, in the Gush. And um, so that that's what it's all about, these Murot Halacha. And what it makes is it, it creates Halachic leaders and makes Halacha accessible to women. And I think also a woman answering Halacha also, men turn to to our halachic women because women have a different outlook when they they're coming from a different place. So now, what we have is the ma'ane hilchati, our WhatsApp group. We have four hundred women on her halachic group each day. A different uh, hal- a different woman of our mishivot halacha of our program answering. There's a mentor, there's a rabbi or a rabbanit that um, you know that work with them on the answer. And what we are doing is first of all, the, the women are learning to be Meshivot Halacha, to be Halacha responders, and the women that are on the Ma'anel Chati trust are turning to us and, and already are accepting that a woman can be a Meshivat Halacha. And, and, and that's I think, is, is a game changer. Um, so that is, I want more and more of that. So I have 400 women on this. Devora, maybe you can tell me how I can get to more. I want a thousand. I want thousand. This is, you're doing it right now. You're doing it right now. Meaning part of what I think you're saying is accessibility and relevance. So I think that's the the challenge that Matan faces. But I also think that it's a challenge that Matan sees. And I think it's meeting that challenge. So that's something that's very exciting. Chaya, last word is going to go to you. 
tough, tough. <laughs> I think, no, I think I think that really it. Ufarat the Yama Kadima Yama Zafona Kadima Venigba to you know continue the spreading of the Torah and seeing that we can create and continue to create the next generation of Torah leadership. Okay, if it's by writing, if it's by putting out podcasts, if it's by helping these women, you know, go on missions and 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 take it to their classroom. And if it's by helping a woman, uh, you know, or a community open another branch, you know, like in remote, they, you know, someone said, okay, let's, we don't want to stop. You know, we want to continue with the learning, even though they're 35 minutes away from our branch here. I think it's, it's just never stopping. I mean, Osha and I don't sleep much, but it's, it's that we, it always, you continue. I mean, you want to continue to grow, continue to think of new programs and be relevant, be relevant for our daughters, granddaughters and um our peers as well and and keep and keep it keep it going and uh you know because we're more you know Amen. so i i want to still give chaya the last word so chaya you can still say it for so, something that i <laughs> wanted to add is that i would like to see more women secular women come to matan i mean we we are open to that you know, we 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 want to greet everyone. We want every woman to see Matan as their home of Torah. So I would like that to grow. We have women that are, you know, that are not your exact, you know, religious or orthodox. We do have women, but I want to see more of that. Hi, you agree with me? Yeah. We want to see. I think, we, I think it's it's you want to see all walks of life uh, here in Israel abroad that 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 are passionate about learning, passionate about their Judaism and take it, take it to the next level of, uh, of interest, you know, on their, their own level and on a, on a national and international level. I will be the person that says that in order for you to do all the things that you do do, you do spend a nice amount of time fundraising. And I think that part of the family nature of what Matan is, is that people respect it and are happy to donate to it. So if I toss out a word here that says, meaning a lot of this institution runs on donations and a lot of the amazing programs that are being done, be it something like a weekly podcast with a such a rich roster of guests on it, uh, all the way down to flying people in at a, a reduced rate to come on a mission, all of that comes at some cost. So I'll toss it out there. But what I would say is thank you both very, very much, especially in these times. I love highlighting good people who are just doing good things. So much hatzlacha to Am Yisrael, to all of our chayalim, and to Matan. Guys, thank you so much. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. I'm Dr. Yosefa Fogel-Rubel, and this is One-on-One Women Talk Torah, a series brought to you by Matan Women's Institute for Torah Study. Please do one-on-one and women's Torah learning a small favor by sharing this podcast with family and friends so that we can reach new listeners. You can stream and download these episodes on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, and Matan's website. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review in the comments. Please send us any feedback at podcast at matan.org.il. That's podcast at matan.org.il. Thanks for listening, everyone.